I just, I just believe God wants to restore so much in our lives. You know, just the, the way that we walk before Him, the boldness, the walking by His Spirit and not the flesh. And what we experienced this morning in worship, you know what? He wants to do that in your life every day. All we have to do is slow down. You know, I've become aware in the last couple of weeks how we are running around like headless chickens. Of the stuff, and can we be honest, most of it has got no eternal value. It's important, but it's got no eternal value. And I just am so aware that I need to slow things down and be careful what I chase. Sometimes my intentions is good, but man, the enemy has always got a plan. And if he can't stop you, he's going to start pushing you. And when he starts pushing you, you're going to run. And you think you're running for Jesus, but you're going to get tired, worn out. You need to stop and connect with God. If you do not have time to spend with Jesus, you are in trouble. If your quiet time is not happening, is not rocking, then you have a problem. If you and your spouse are not praying together, I want to say you have a problem. If you're not praying with your kids, if there's no time for the word, you have a problem. Slow it down. Slow it down. Amen. Amen. I can preach the whole time with her doing that. That, that kind of amazing me is. All right, we're going to see God move. Father, we just thank you for your word and that your word is true. And Father, I pray even as I minister your word this morning that we will have hearts to receive. Father, that everything will be soaked and covered with your love and your presence as we spend this time together in your word, Father. Oh, you are so good. Lord, we love you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, this morning I want to sort of, you know, Lorette used this line last week. She said she's tagging on to what Cheslin preached. Cheslin, you started something, but... Um, so, who of you remember the, the, the sermon? Who, you, who of you were here when he preached about unfriending the world? Okay, was, was that a powerful word? Did it help you? If you weren't here, it's on our YouTube channel. Yes, we have one of those. Um, and you go, go, can, get, can go and watch that and um, really just hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying. And what Cheslin, in short basically said is that we cannot um, be friends with the world and friends with God. You can't have it both ways. And scripture makes it so clear that we need to decide who we are following, where, where we are part of. It was a thought-provoking sermon that will help you discern what is going on in your life, in the stuff that you need to say maybe no to. And how do we unfriend the world? All that in that sermon there on YouTube. And then Lorette pre preached about the narrow road. Now, I must just say, it is amazing uh, as the pastor to, to kind of just sit back and allow uh, those that we trust to, to preach and bring the Word of God. And just to, It's amazing to see how the Holy Spirit actually speaks to us. Because I had nothing to do with these sermons. All right? They, they were really just coming from God's heart through them. And she preached about... Uh, the narrow road, asking the question, why do you follow Jesus? Why do you follow Jesus? And, and, and caused us to reevaluate where we are at, actually at this time in our lives, and maybe just to think again, am I following Jesus, and why am I following him? Am I busy with other stuff, or where am I at at this time of my life? Am I pursuing him? Also, again, a very thought-provoking, a challenging word for us to consider. And I, I think I can honestly say we've been called to an account. 
by the Spirit of the Lord. And we need to hear his voice when he says, listen, maybe you just need to look at what's going on. Because here's the thing. God is on the move. There are things coming that we need to be ready for. And if this is the word of the Lord for us in the last two weeks, we would do well to, to consider it, to go home, think about it, to ponder, to change, to make re, recalibrate our lives, put back the stuff that is important, not to us, but to him. Remove some of the stuff. I'm, I'm really, I'm so aware that we need to remove stuff from our lives. I have to remove stuff from my life that are distracting from him. I'm chasing stuff. And, 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 and who of you are not human? Because if you are, it happens so quickly, doesn't it? Nah, you suddenly you like something. You see, and I'm a sucker for 4x4 four four stuff. Oh, my word. That and, 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 and hardware. It will be dangerous if I have a lot of money. Those two idols will receive a lot. Okay. <laughs> okay, but I recognize what God is speaking to me about, what I need to deal with, and I trust that He is doing the same for you. So this morning, what if church? What if church? I don't know. But let's look at it. I want to start off with Genesis 2 verse 24 to 25, well-known portion of scripture. Those that are married know these scriptures. Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast or cling to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Now this one flesh thing for me is still a mystery. It is the most incredible thing how God can take two people from way across the spectrum, put them together in one household and they become one flesh. It is incredible how the Spirit of God can move in two people so powerfully that they can look at one another and know It is scary, but beautiful. Okay, so they will become one flesh. And the man and his wife, wife were both naked, and they were not ashamed. And I, I so believe this is God's heart for every marriage, that there will be nakedness. There will not, not be cover-up, that it will be clean, open, everything is seen, not just physically naked. Jeans. Okay? Everything in every aspect. That's why the, one of the toughest things for men to learn uh, and, and to be naked in is when you get home and your wife says, so how was your day? And your standard answer was, oh, it's okay. It's not what she wants to hear. She wants the full download. But then brace yourself. Because then you have to sit and say, so how was your day? <laughs> okay? And that spaghetti... That touches everything. There's a lot going on there I've learned over, the, over life. But here's the thing. When a, a man leaves his father and mother and he clings to his wife, stuff happens. Produce. <laughs> Fruit of your loin happens. We, we have children. Nah? And children come with, 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 with a contract with very fine print at the bottom. And suddenly you find yourself, you know, where, where initially it was about us. Oh, honey. Ooh. You know, it's chocolates and it's cookies and it's, and it's everything. Flowers and, and weekends away. And, you know, oh, come on. It's, let's go somewhere. you there, man. Suddenly you have kids and you go, let's go somewhere. And you're like, I say, mall. I remember I had to buy a different car because everything didn't fit into the Uno's boot. I had to literally disassemble the pram <laughs> to get the pram in there, take off the wheels and everything, put that in there, and, and then have Jamil on the seat in front with a whole bunch of stuff in there because the pram took up the whole boot of the Uno. 
So things change. And then you grow, and, and suddenly your, your marriage becomes about your kids. And the training and the equipping and everything that is happening here, and, 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 and the moaning and, and stuff. And because if you, you know what's not nice about parents? Parenting, rather, is that you have to be that, a parent. So, if if I come to Jamal and I say, "Listen, buddy, Jerry, on a course here," and he goes, "No," then I don't go, "Oh, my son, you know, can I explain to you again why you have to feed the dogs? If you don't feed the dogs, they might die." You know, or maybe chow something that they're not supposed to. You know, when I come to my son and say, listen, feed the dogs, I expect him to understand that, they, you know, we've been through this. <laughs> my thing is normally, if you want the pet, you need to feed it. I'm st still battling with the poop. But, but that's why I've got a lawnmower. All right, so we... <laughs> Yeah, so, so I'm teaching them responsibility. Now they both have licenses. Caleb got his license on Wednesday. Here I help. <laughs> In any case, but now I'm on this journey with them about stewardship of a car. Huh? Who of you know cars are expensive? Yeah. Who do you know if, you, if you, you get in a crash? It's your worst nightmare. Because the car that you've paid so much for is now not there. And, and then you have to, oh, man. So we're talking about stewardship. So my instruction to them is, I'm not washing the, the Yaris anymore. It's now your responsibility. It must be cleaned and, and et cetera. That's what it comes with. So I'm teaching them these things. So, so what, what Scripture here says is almost like the broad vision. Because when a family gets together, things happen, man. You see, I was wise enough to stop at two. Some of you, yeah. May the Lord bless you with all your kids. That's amazing. It's such a privilege to raise children. You know, this side of heaven, marriage is one of the most sacred relationships that we can have. That relationship that we pursue, that we, we give everything to, that is until death do us part. Such an important relationship. And, and it will be a different world if we can steward it, guide it, you know, treasure it, work at it, etc. But it has become the target of Satan's destruction. He wants to remove. Just think of that, you know, at the moment the divorce rate is sky high. Divorce has become the rule, not the exception. It's like it's a given. If people get married, you know, they, they'll get divorced. And it's become this whole ugly thing that the enemy is doing. Now, stats shows us that young people don't get married. Because I think the example that they see is that, why? Who wants to put yourself through a divorce and all that stuff? And many children are now the, the product or the result of that, having grown up in that, because parents got divorced, and they have to sit with them. Now, stats shows us that that people are not getting married. And for me, that is a sad day that the enemy is actually able to, to get us to such a point where, where marriage has become kind of blasé. We don't fight for it anymore. Some of you do. Chris and Sharon. How many years now? 30! Caramba! Some of you aren't even that old yet. So if you want to know, how long you looking at Chris and Sharon stand by your hand too. I mean, come on, 38 years. Ek is nou eers so oud. Wat bedoel jy? Well done. Well, can we give them a hand? Come on. You see, it's, it's become very evident that the enemy is serious about destroying things. And, and, and as I was thinking about this, what makes him so successful in destroying marriages? 
And as I thought about it, the one thing that I definitely see is that the easiest way to destroy this relationship, and, and you should have been here Wednesday with a focus on the family, it was top notch. Um, but the one thing that he does is he gets us to, to pull in different directions. There's a different thing that we're pursuing. We do not have a common goal. We, we, we are not one anymore. We're actually standing in opposition to one another. Now, here's the thing. Once I stand in opposition to this woman, it's going to go pear shape. When I stand next to her, it's different. So, if we're standing like this, it's cool. If I was standing like this, <laughs> okay, it might get romantic, you know, but, but, but I mean, if we are opposing one another, you know, if, I, if I'm now like, hey, 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 you hey, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> but if we're standing like this, we are faced outward, facing anything and everything, stabbing her in the back. I might eat myself. Yeah. And all the devil does, donkey, is he gets a couple to stand in a position. Man, and he uses stupid stuff. Have you ever heard about the, the, the toothpaste proppy? Or the toilet seat? The cereal box. Oh, is that a thing now? The cereal box. Praise the year, don't need a cereal box. What else? Towels and the clothes on the floor. But none of the men here do that. <laughs> <laughs> the toilet roll. Oh my. Yeah. Uh, okay, so it must. So, so what's the consensus? The toilet roll must go over. Yeah. I win. I just, I, I win. It was the majority. I say, okay. <laughs> Can you put up that picture quickly? You've seen this picture before. This is all that happens. You know, we've got two donkeys in a marriage because none of them are old enough. We need Jesus. Okay, and, and they, they want to pursue stuff and it becomes quite heated. But what we need to get to is the realization that if we work together, if we pursue the same goal, if we have the heart of Jesus, we can accomplish anything. So all the devil does, he gets us to this point. He just holds us there. Where we pull in two different directions, where we fight continually, and we are in opposition to one another. And like I say, it's the small stuff. Bible speaks about that diclean yokelsis that destroys stuff. And we need to be aware. You know, both in your if you in your, if you're married in your in your marriage, what are those things? But if you are single. You need to know which are the things that are destroying your life. That are pulling you away from the purposes of God. So my next question to you this morning. Because since my wife asked such nice questions and Cheslin and so on. So I thought I'll ask a question. I want to ask you the question. What is church to you? Just take a moment. Just think about it. Maybe share with someone next to you quickly. Let's take up a couple of seconds here. Just tell someone next to you, what is church to you? Do it. Go. Jij is alleen. Jij moet skyf. Sit hier by Cynthia alle. All right. I say some good answers. Let, let's maybe hear quickly. What what is shout out two or three? 
Fellowship, a bunch of fellows in the ship. Hopefully the lady says well. What else? Veiligheid. Is that what you say? Veiligheid. Safety. Family. What else? God's family. Cool. What was the gun? <laughs> yes, we saw that's why Sharon came as well. It's for the coffee. No? Ah, you know. Thank you, for the Father, for that strategy of drawing people. If we have to have good coffee, that's fine. It's like good bait on a, on a line. You'll catch some fish. What else? Like-mindedness. Okay, strengthens your inner man. All right. Corporate worshipping together. Okay, so I've got a different question. It's not up there. But here's my question. Why do you think church is to God? Just, just, just let that question maybe. What is church to Jesus? How does he see this? If we call this church, what does he see? Harvest. You see, sometimes I think we get so... Um, stuck. So opinionated about what we think church should be that we fail to ask the one who made it it's like marriage there's lots of opinions about marriage and how to make it amazing but we fail to ask the one who made it whose design it is whose plan it was and still is we fail to ask him what do you want to accomplish with this? Where are you going with this? You know, one of the questions that I face after COVID is, how do you think the church will change after COVID? My honest, quite honestly, answer is, quite honestly, is it will be what we allow it to be. If we're going to say it's online, it's going to become online. If we say it's defragmented, it becomes just home groups then that's what it's going to be but isn't that then us that are determining what church should look like instead of Jesus are we not now following the popular opinion or the pressures that is around us and allowing that to dictate what this is we should not let tradition also dictate what this is because that can also be dangerous. Matthew 16, 15 to 19 says the following. He said to them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter. Man, you have to love Peter. He's ready. He goes, you are the Christ. The son of the living God. Probably the most profound thing that Peter said up to that point. And Jesus goes like, what? Sure. Wow. Look at you. And Jesus said to him, he answers him, Blessed are you, Simon uh, Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, oh, Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now can I just maybe say something here. That we are not building on Peter. He's not the rock. His name means rock. But he's not the rock on which the church is built. The church is built on the revelation that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. That is the truth. That is the reality. That is why we are here today is because of that revelation. 
Because in this world, there are many claiming to, uh, you know, to the road to heaven. But the fact that he is saying that you are the Christ, the son of the living God, on that revelation, Jesus will build his church. And we will be in great trouble if we pursue anything else in this environment. If the focus becomes something different, apart from the fact that we are pursuing Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. You know, if we disciple people unto us, we are in trouble. If it's about a course, if it's about anything else, we are in trouble. If it's unto Christ, I think we're in a good space. And I love this, that he says, on this revelation, if we hold fast to that, if we cling to that, if that is in our hearts, the gates of hell will not prevail against this church of Jesus. They will break through walls. They will do incredible stuff. Why? Because they are the children of God. They are flowing with the Spirit. And I love verse 19. And then he says, now just hear this. You don't want to know who you are in Jesus? Just, just read this quickly. He says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Bump someone next to you and say, I've got a pair of keys. I've got some keys. Now I can tell you what. To my sons we've given keys. When they were little. Now I've given them different keys. But any case. They used to try and unlock anything. They used to throw keys where they shouldn't belong as well. So the fact that we've got the keys means that we need to unlock certain things or lock certain things we have been given the authority of the kingdom some of you have the keys here on your belt and you just enjoy the klingel in school they know when Lorette's coming because she always has her classes keys around her neck and we actually know that Klingel so we can know when she's coming it's incredible I can tell you okay Lorette's coming down the hall now she'll be here shortly because I know that okay that's his rabbit trail but saints you have been given the keys of heaven the kingdom and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven so i guess the natural question is what are you binding and what are you losing how are you using these keys that jesus has given us or is it just there on your key ring at home on your mantelpiece or somewhere see we need to allow god at this time to reveal to us what the keys are what his heart is for the church for us as a, as, a, as, a, as a body that we will not deviate from building on the truth that he has given us on that truth that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God now that revelation causes me to reevaluate some stuff in my life what is standing in opposition to that revelation but we'll get there now So let us unlock some things. John 17, verse 17 to 23 says this. Sanctify them in the truth. And then it continues. Your word is truth. Now you can stand still at that little scripture. Sanctify them in the truth. If I do not have the word his word i will be bound i will not be sanctified it's through that word and, and ephesians speaks about it where god where the, where, as, the, as the bride washes his bride with his word so your quiet time your scripture reading the basics of christianity is important to be in scripture to be washed with the truth because it washes away the nonsense do you know some nonsense? 
the cobwebs, the chemors that is going on here. Yeah, this is an amazing thing, but man, it can be full of nonsense. So get the truth in there. Verse 18. As you send me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. Now, this is not Matthew 28. This is John 17. This is Jesus praying the most intimate prayer, the recording of the most intimate prayer between him and his father. And what does he pray for? He says, as you have sent me into the world. Congratulations, you're in the world. Huh? Yeah. Just tell someone, hey, <laughs> you are here. Congratulations. So he has sent us into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself. Wow. That they also may be sanctified in truth. Wow. Jesus leads by example. He sanctifies, he consecrates himself so that we will be sanctified in the truth. I do not ask for these only. Ah, and now he thinks about us. But also for those who will believe in me uh, through their word. So that is us. And then he continues in verse 21. That they may all be one. Whew. He prays for something. That same mystery that happens when a man clings to a woman. He leaves his father and mother. They become one flesh. This, this relationship, this place where, where it's two different worlds that are coming together. Here we have a lot of different worlds coming together. Backgrounds, experiences. You know, you have revelations that I haven't had. You've been, you know, gone through stuff that I have We're all sitting here and he says, listen, let them be one. Let them all be one. It's not designated to a select few, but his prayer is for each one of us that we will be one. Wow. Now, now just think about this. In your definition of church, what you shared with people, how does that now come into the play? Is that what you see? Is that what you desire? Is that what you pursue? Okay. Okay. That they all may be one, just as you, Father, and are in me, and I in you. That they also may be in us. Wow. And then he goes on, he says, so that, I've seen them in the world, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Us being one will show the world that God has sent Jesus Christ. Now let's think about that thing of opposition here. So what does the enemy do to distort us reflecting that truth? He gets us not to be one. He gets us to stand in opposition to one another. Not to like one another. To withdraw from one another. To pursue other things. Not true? And that taints and fogs up the truth that he has come to this world. Verse 22, the glory that you have given me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one. He repeats this now. Then it means it's important. Uh, thank you for the amen. 23, I in them and you in me. Oh, look at this. I in them, and you in me. That they may become almost one. Perfectly. Do you see Jesus' desire here? For this church he wants to build on that revelation. Is that we will be perfectly one. I can say that is, this, this, that is his desire for every marriage. Is that they will be perfectly one. And again, so that the world may know that you have sent me 
and love them even as you have loved me. This whole prayer reflects the heart of why Jesus actually came. Because he loves us. Because he is passionate about us. Because without him, we cannot be one. Makes me think about Romans 8. If we're going to continue to walk in the flesh that will hinder us from becoming one. So what if the church are one? What if the church are one? One with Jesus and one with one another. What will change? What if the church start pulling in the same direction as one? More importantly, what if we start pulling in the same direction as Jesus? Leaving our own agendas behind and pursuing what he wants to do. Do we have the same heart that he has, which is, according to John 17, that the world may know that he was sent? You see, that can so easily get lost between other so-called important stuff. Or have we allowed that important stuff to draw us away from what is on his heart? Okay? I guess the question for me, maybe we can, I can ask this to you, is, is are you on fire for God as you sit here? Are you on fire? Is he what you love, breathe, and, and, and that's who you are? So what is hindering the, the, the success and the progress of where we are going? I want to ask a question on that. And my question is this. Are you going to church? Or are you the church? Because there is a difference. Are you going to church? Or are you the church? If the church is something I do, or place that I go, then other things will come in opposition with my time, my effort, my whatever I want to do. My passion and my zeal will be tainted when church is just somewhere that I go. It's a religious habit. It's not who I am. When that opposition happens, I will reach that point where I have to now make decisions on the de demands on my time. What is now more important than Jesus' mission? You see, because when I am the church, I am the bride. And the bride looks forward to her husband. The bride is preparing. Ladies, the day you got married, for those that, are, that got married, how much effort did you do? You see, I, I remember my wedding day, standing at the altar, um, waiting. I wasn't on the other side. So how did that feel like, preparing for the bride, or the, the groom? And this is where we are at now, is that the bride needs to prepare herself for the groom. My desire now, our desire now should be to prepare ourselves. Revelation 19, 6 to 8 says this. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude. Okay, so there's a lot of people. Like the roar of many waters, like the sound of mighty pulls of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah! That's just me. It's going to sound different. For the Lord our God, he, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen, watch this was the righteous deeds of the saints. 
What is the linen made of? The righteous deeds of the saints. We are called to live a life that the righteous deeds that we do will one day be the very thing that the bride is wearing. But there's this multitude of people that are excited because the bride has made herself ready. The marriage is coming. Saints, that is on the way. That will be here one day. And if we're going to stand in opposition to what God is doing, we are in trouble. Our righteous deeds need to become that which reflects Him. See, what if church was who I am, not just, just a place where I go? What if church is not about me, but is about Him? What if church was the church moving in the powerful glory of His might? That's why we have next weekend to equip and train ourselves so that we can see more of that. What if church was about discipling people unto Jesus and not just about events, but using events and courses and stuff to do those things? What if church was where the love of God was made manifest? What if church was a place where we all worked towards a, a common goal? It's to make him known and to see his glory. You see, we heard some sermons in the last two weeks which calls us to an account to reevaluate where we are in our personal lives. I guess the question is where do we stand in terms of those questions? Saints, do you go to church or are you the church? Where is your heart at? The church has been called and anointed by the groom to do incredible things. Just go read Ephesians 5 again and see what he says about his bride. So it's this church, the bride, needs to make herself ready. But we need to be careful. Can you put up that photo again? About this. You see here, in what we call church, if we are the bride, if we are one, if this is what Jesus is so passionate about, then we need to be careful not to pull against one another, not to stand in opposition to one another. We should be quick to restore relationships and help each other, to introduce people to other people because you never know what the influence of that person will be on the other person so that they can grow. God has put us together here because I need you in my life. I really do. You guys shape and mold me like it's not funny. But I guess you also need me because we are supposed to be one. So let's walk together. There will always be lots of tension there, like Cheslin put it, between what the world wants and what God wants. And we need to understand it. We need to recognize that there will be opposition, but we need to make the wise decisions. We must be careful that we do not pull against Jesus because we consider other things more important than what he is about. We must be careful that we don't pull against one another and so destroy the work of God in this place, that we actually become agents of Satan in the house of the Lord because we are dwartrekker. You know, if you go read what the scripture speaks about sowing strife, where I speak to someone else, you know, and I, I tell them about something that, that Kuba said, and, and, and in the meantime, I sort it out, but they still sit with that thing. And they don't like me because you shared something that you actually should have shared with me, but you shared it with her. And now we have a problem. Our relationship takes strain because there's something else going on here. I want to encourage you, if you have something against someone, please go sit down with them with a coffee. Yes, it's going to take some guts. But let's keep the oneness that God has set apart for us here to do. You know, and sometimes in church when you are expected to do stuff, sometimes it's just like feeding the dog. I don't have to tell you again why to do it. It's just, can we do it? Because this family needs to go somewhere. 
as one, we need to go somewhere. I see my time. I wanted to do a little um, illustration, but I'll, I'll not do that now for the sake of time. So my prayer is that we will be one as Jesus has prayed for us. That God will show up in us as a congregation and us as the bride in the global church, in the church nationally. That we will see the bride making herself ready, beautiful. That the acts of righteousness will be the things that the world see. That the oneness, how will the world know that we are his disciples? In the way that we love one another, is what scripture says. Saints, I believe as we move forward, the one thing that the enemy would want to do is bring division among us. Well, wants to get us to pull against one another. Let's not allow the enemy in our midst. And let's help one another to be one. Let's pray that prayer with Jesus. That we will see the fulfillment of that happening in our day. But for me, the biggest question that I had to face, even as I was thinking about this over the last couple of weeks, is really that question of, am I the church or do I just go to church? Have I come in a place where I'm standing in opposition to God and what He wants to do? Because there's stuff that I consider important or valuable. It caused me to reevaluate stuff that is going on in my life and bring it under Christ so that I can actually pursue what He wants to do in today's age. I've said this before. We have been called for a time such as this. We have been set apart. And if we walk in the anointing of God uh, that He wants to put on us, this world will change. So let's trust God for greater.